Japanese swords are inextricably linked with a type of supernatural creature from ancient Japan known as Oni, referred to in English as demons or ogres. Renowned swords often carry legends of samurai and emperors who use them to slay Oni. This connection between Japanese swords and Oni is still strongly recognized today, as seen in the globally popular anime Demon Slayer, which vividly portrays these traditional legends of Oni slaying. In this chapter, we will introduce the top three famous swords known for their legendary feats against Oni. Before we get to the rankings, let's discuss the Oni a bit more. Oni are a familiar presence in Japan, encountered frequently in various forms. The event of Setsubun involves throwing beans at people wearing Oni masks to drive away evil spirits and is celebrated nationwide. In Iwate Prefecture, there exists a traditional performing art called Onikenbai, where performers don demon masks and dance with swords. The widespread belief in Oni throughout Japan and the emergence of the Japanese sword both date back to roughly the same period, about a thousand years ago during the Heian period. So what exactly are Oni in Japanese history? Are they merely fictional monsters? The answer may become clear as we explore the stories of these three legendary swords. Number three, Sohaya. Sohaya is the beloved sword of the 8th century general Sakanoe no Tamuramaro, famed for its Oni slaying legend. Tamuramaro dedicated three swords to Kiyomizu Temple in Hyogo Prefecture, among which Sohaya is believed to be one. However, it remains unclear which of the three, numbered as one, two, and three, is actually Sohaya. Their lengths are 25.2 inches, 26.1 inches, and 22.7 inches respectively, and each blade has a slight curve. Crafted during the transitional period from straight swords to curved Japanese swords, Sohaya represents a critical moment just before the birth of the true katana making it a sword of significant historical value. Tamaramaro, who carried Sohaya, served the emperor and is still celebrated as a hero today. In his time, Japan was just beginning to establish itself as a nation centered around Kyoto, and its influence did not yet extend to every corner of the country. In 788 AD, as a military officer serving the emperor, Tamaramaro was tasked with a formidable mission to subdue the Emeshi, described as Oni, inhabiting the then remote region of present-day Tohoku. Leading a force of 50,000 soldiers, he marched into Tohoku, fulfilling his duty to the court. After a long journey, the Imperial Army finally arrived in the Tohoku region, ready to begin their campaign against the Emishi. Suddenly, they were faced with Emishi warriors like none they had seen before, wielding uniquely shaped swords and mounted on horses. Despite the numerical superiority of the Imperial foot soldiers, 50,000 against 2,000 to 3,000, the small band of mounted emishi launched surprise attacks using the terrain to their advantage, forcing the Imperial Army into a disastrous retreat. The swords used by the emishi were known as Warabiteto, the first curved blades in Japan, which later inspired the development of the katana. 
this battle instilled a profound fear of the Emishi in the Imperial forces, partly due to the charismatic leadership and tactics of the Emishi leader, Aterui. In 794, with Tamura Maro appointed as the deputy commander, he led a force of 100,000 in a second expedition against the Emishi, this time wielding his beloved sword, Sohaya. Renowned for his swordsmanship, he used Sohaya to defeat numerous Emishi, although this battle inflicted significant losses on the Emishi, like before, they failed to capture the elusive leader, Aterui, and were forced to retreat. In 797, Tamura Maro was appointed as a shogun and was entrusted with all military affairs concerning Tohoku. He then embarked on another Oni extermination campaign. Believing that the Emishi's strength had been significantly reduced in the previous battle. He aimed for pacification through reconciliation policies rather than force. Specifically, he sought to win over the Emishi by granting them official ranks and teaching them agricultural and civil engineering techniques. By gaining many allies in this way, he began the final phase in 802. He demanded the surrender of Atarui, who continued to resist until the end. Finally, Atarui surrendered, accompanied by 500 of his close aides. Tamanamaro, having fought on the front lines for many years, realized something. The Emishi, whom they had feared and called Oni, were human beings, just like themselves. Upon reaching Kyoto, he argued to the court that Aterui and his followers should be returned to Tohoku. He intended for them to become leaders and contribute to the region. However, the court did not believe that Aterui and his followers were human and treated them as Oni executing them. Years later, after successfully subjugating the Emishi, Tamura Maro returned to Kiyomiza Temple, where he had prayed for victory before the Tohoku expedition and dedicated his three beloved swords, including Sohaya. These three swords were designated as important cultural properties in 1981 and due to their advanced state of decay, are currently preserved at the Tokyo National Museum. The Emishi of Tohoku were described as Oni in contemporary documents and depicted as such in paintings created later. But why did the court attack Tohoku in the first place? At that time, the court's finances were in dire straits. As social unrest grew, the emperor initiated the construction of Todaiji Temple. This was based on the idea that the power of Buddhism would protect the nation. However, building the temple required money. To construct the great Buddha of Todaiji, a large amount of gold was needed to cover the statue. Initially, it was planned to import the gold from overseas, but the emperor was at a loss due to a lack of funds. Then, an official who was conducting a survey reported the discovery of a gold vein in Tohoku. Rejoicing, the court saw this as divine guidance and began the invasion of Tohoku. In other words, the court justified its invasion by portraying the people of Tohoku as Oni and positioning them as evil. Even today, in some prefectures of the Tohoku region, Aterui, the leader of the Emishi, is revered as a hero. Number 2. Kenukigata Tachi 
Kanuki Gata Tachi was the beloved sword of the samurai Fujiwara no Hidesato, who was active in the 10th century. This sword, used by one of Japan's earliest samurai, features a blade and hilt that are integrated into a single piece. The blade is curved, a design that evolved from the Warabi Tito used by the Emishi. The hilt has holes which absorb the shock of strikes. The blade length is approximately 28 inches, and the blade bears marks from arrows and swords, indicating that it was likely used in actual combat. This sword is currently designated as an important cultural property and is housed at Isejingu. The owner of this sword, Hidesato, is known for the legend of cutting down the samurai Taira no Masakado, who is now recognized as one of Japan's three great vengeful spirits. During the Heian period, the development of Shōen manor lands was widespread throughout Japan. At that time, farmland and mountains were privately owned rather than state property. Meanwhile, in the capital, the Fujiwara clan wielded immense power. Aristocrats who were sidelined by the Fujiwara clan sought to curry favor with them to obtain provincial government positions. These aristocrats, once in office, dedicated themselves to the development of rural farmland. Consequently, in regions dominated by private lands, disputes arose among aristocrats over their rights. It was under these conditions that the samurai class emerged in Japan. Among those who became prominent was Taira no Masakado. He served the Fujiwara clan in the capital for a long time, trying to obtain an official position but without success. Frustrated, he returned to the Kanto region where he engaged in fierce disputes with his relatives over land inheritance. Masakado resorted to force, defeating all his opponents. Having brought much of Kanto under his control, he eventually declared himself the new emperor and decided to rebel against the court. The court was furious upon hearing this. To suppress the rebellion, they dispatched Hidesato, the owner of this sword. Although he was from the Fujiwara clan, he had become a samurai in the provinces. In a Japan where samurai had grown too powerful, the court had no choice but to rely on samurai to subdue other samurai. Hidesato joined forces with Masakado's cousin, Saramori, and set out. They struggled against Masakado's overwhelming military power, but after several battles and with the help of allies, they finally beheaded Masakado. Thus, Hirasato saved the court from its greatest crisis. For his achievements, he was granted titles by the court and eventually became a powerful figure in Kanto, becoming the ancestor of many samurai families. On the other hand, Masakado's head, having met an untimely death, was taken to the capital and displayed on a riverbank. Even months later, his eyes remained open and uncorrupted as if still alive. Every night, he was said to cry out, Where is my body? Bring it here. Reattach my head so we can fight once more. A poet witnessed this and composed a poem upon which Masakado's heart burst into laughter and soared high towards the Kanto region. It eventually fell, and it is said that a mound was erected where it landed, known today as Masakado's Head Mound in Chiyoda, Tokyo. This head mound remains intact to this day, 
located in a prime area worth 4 billion yen. Attempts have been made to demolish or reduce the size of the land, but various misfortunes have occurred each time. As a result, the head mound has not been removed and is meticulously maintained to this day to avoid invoking Masakado's curse. Number 1. Dojigiri Yasutsuna Dojigiri Yasutsuna is renowned as the sword that killed Shuten Doji, one of Japan's most famous oni. It is currently designated as a national treasure. Crafted by Yasutsuna, who is historically recognized as the first swordsmith to create Japanese swords, this sword is considered his greatest masterpiece. The blade length is approximately 31.6 inches, characterized by a strong curve and a wide blade. The Hamon temper line features a series of small wavy patterns, creating a beautiful blade. Since its creation around the 10th century, it has been a treasured possession of the Genji clan and was later passed down to prominent families such as the Toyotomi and Tokugawa shogunate. Today, it is owned by the state and housed at the Tokyo National Museum. The protagonist of this story is Minamoto no Yorimitsu, a renowned samurai serving the Fujiwara clan in the capital. At that time, many young noble women in the capital were being kidnapped. When an Onmyoji, a practitioner of Japanese esoteric cosmology, divined the identity of the culprit, it was revealed to be Shuten Doji, an oni based in Mount Oe in Hyogo Prefecture. Yorimitsu and four of his skilled samurai were chosen to carry out the expedition to defeat Shuten Doji. They set out for Mount Oe. Along the way, they encountered an old man who gave them a poisonous sake effective against Oni and advised them to disguise themselves as mountain monks. Upon reaching the Oni's castle, they were soon confronted by the Oni. Claiming to be lost mountain monks, they asked for shelter, and the Oni accepted them. As a gesture of thanks, Yorimitsu offered the poisonous sake to the Oni, who began to drink and feast. Finally, the leader of the Oni, Shuten Doji, appeared. He was about 20 feet tall and had five horns. Shuten Doji, drunk from the sake, told them that they once lived in Mount Hie, but fled to Mount Oe when Buddhist monks built temples there. After the feast, the Oni, overcome by the poisoned sake, quickly fell asleep. Late at night, when the Oni were deep in slumber, Yorimitsu and his men sneaked into Shuten Doji's bedroom. Yorimitsu raised his sword Dojigiri and struck at Shuten Doji's neck, severing it. However, the severed head floated in the air and attacked Yorimitsu. His comrades quickly came to his aid and Shuten Doji was ultimately defeated. As he lay dying, Shuten Doji cursed them, saying, You deceived me. Oni never deceive humans. And then he died. This Oni extermination legend has inspired various modern creations and is enjoyed as entertainment. However, there is a sad history hidden within this story. The following isn't directly related to Japanese swords, but not wanting to dismiss this tale as merely a story of defeating villains, let's explain a bit further. About a thousand years ago, Japan was not yet under unified rule, and many people lived outside the control of the imperial court. 
The people of Tohoku, mentioned earlier, are an example of this. As the imperial court expanded its control, those who did not submit to its authority were labeled as Oni. Additionally, there were many groups who built wealth through iron production and manufacturing outside the court's control. And these people were also called Oni. In ancient ironworking, craftsmen would judge the temperature inside the furnace by the color of the iron, constantly watching the flame with their dominant eye. This often resulted in blindness in one eye. Moreover, occupational hazards such as losing limbs were common. The fear and awe of their unusual appearance eventually led to these individuals being feared as yokai or demons. In fact, there are iron production ruins on Mount Oe where Shuten Doji was said to reside. Similarly, many mountains across Japan with Oni legends also have iron production ruins. Considering this, the legend of Shuten Doji may not be entirely fictional. Those who were labeled as Oni might have been powerful families engaged in ironworking who lived on Mount Oe and under the pretext of Oni extermination, the imperial court may have taken over their lands. We hope you enjoyed this exploration into the world of Japanese swords. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more exciting content about the history of Japanese swords. Until next time, sayonara.